Good evening. And first of all, what about those Perseid meteors? As I'm sure you know, we expected a really major meteor shower on the night of August the 11th, because we get Perseids every year, but this time the parent comet, Swift Tuttle, has just been back, and we thought we might have a really grand display. Well, I'm afraid we didn't. Uh, most of England was crowded out. I certainly was down at Silsi. In any case, even though the Perseids were rather richer than usual, we didn't have a major storm. All the same, some bright meteors were seen. Uh, in Alderney, Michael Maunder had clear skies, and he got some nice pictures, including one of an exploding Perseid. So it was quite interesting. But um, as I say, we didn't have a really major storm, and we may be luckier next year. I don't know. Anyway, some meteors were seen. For a long time now, there's been discussion about a possible tenth planet, planet 10, planet X, call it what you will, going around the sun further out than Neptune and Pluto, the most distant of the known planets. Well, it may or may not be there. There have been many hunts for it. Hasn't turned up yet. But very recently, we have found some very strange bodies moving about in that remote part of the solar system. And they're very curious indeed. And here's a picture of one, known for the moment as 1992 QB1. There it is in the circle. Hasn't got an official name yet. It has been known as Smiley, but I'm sure that won't be the name finally adopted. It's fairly small, between one and 200 miles across, so not a proper planet, and it goes around the sun at a distance of something like 4,000 million miles, and that's way up beyond Neptune. And the others are being discovered, so there are strange things out there. And what I want to try and do in this program is to try and link these things, which may be planetesimals, or the building blocks of the planets, with uh, comets and with asteroids. And there may be a much more of a link there than we believe that there was only a few years ago. And this also may be linked up with the possible Planet 10. But first of all, let me refresh your memory about the layout of the solar system. Have the Sun in the middle, one star, going around in Mercury. Venus, now nicely visible in the eastern sky before dawn. Then the Earth, and then the red planet Mars. Beyond Mars, we come to a wide gap in which move thousands of small worlds known as minor planets or asteroids. Only one, Ceres, is as much as 500 miles across, and only one, Vesta, is ever visible with the naked eye. We don't now believe these are remnants of a shattered planet. We believe they were formed in that part of the solar system where no major planet could form because of the pull of Jupiter. There are some small asteroids, and they are small, which spring in from the main belt and may pass close to the Earth. We call these close approach asteroids, and I'll say more about them in a few moments. Beyond the asteroids, we come to the four giants. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. At the moment, Jupiter has gone into the evening twilight, but a little while ago, I made a sketch of it with my 15-inch telescope, and I showed there its belts. Uh, you can't see the great red spot there. That was on the far side of the planet. But Saturn is there, and that's a sketch I made of Saturn a few nights ago, and it really is a glorious sight, and the rings are still well displayed. Beyond, we have the green planet Uranus, and then the blue planet Neptune. Now, those drawings were made with a very big telescope, the Palomar 60-inch, but you can't see very much on them, because although they're big, something like 30,000 miles across, they are a very long way away indeed. Uranus takes 84 years to go around the sun, Neptune nearly 165 years. Now, the story of how Neptune was discovered is highly relevant. Uh, Uranus can just be seen with the naked eye, if you know where it is, it was discovered, by chance, in 1781, by William Herschel, who was mapping the sky with a homemade telescope. Now, when a planet's found, the first thing it's done is to work out how it ought to move. And this was done with Uranus, but something was not right. Uranus would not behave. It wandered away from its projected path, so something was pulling upon it. And that something turned out to be another planet, the one we call Neptune. And the mathematicians worked out where Neptune must be, by observing its pull on Uranus, and it turned up in just the right position in 1846. That was fine. And things looked right. But they weren't quite. There was still something just a bit wrong with the way in which Uranus and Neptune moved. And this was taken up by the American astronomer Percival Lowell. Now, we remember Lowell today, I think rather unfortunately, because of his rather wild theories about canals on Mars. But um, he was a good mathematician, among other things, and uh, by studying Uranus and Neptune, he worked out where a new planet ought to be. This was Planet X. He looked for it. He didn't find it. He died in 1916. And then for a long time after that, nothing was done. And then in 1929, 
astronomers at Lowell's Observatory at Flagstaff in Arizona, they came back to it and decided to have a new hunt. And they hired Clyde Tombaugh. Now, Clyde's now in his 80s. He was a young student then. And he was put in charge of the search and given a very fine 13-inch telescope to try. And there's the telescope itself. Well, he began in 1929. And in 1930, he discovered the planet we now call Pluto. And that's the actual discovery plate. You can see there Pluto marked by the arrows. That large blob is the overexposed image of the star Delta Geminorum. And everything seemed fine. The solar system was complete. But again, before long, it became quite clear that something was badly wrong. Because Pluto didn't seem to be an ordinary kind of planet. And the right from the outset, there were doubts whether it ought to be regarded as a proper planet at all. And there were two main reasons. First of all, its path or orbit. Most of the planets go around the sun in orbits that are almost circular. Pluto doesn't. It has an eccentric orbit, and it brings it closer into the sun than Neptune. And the orbit's also highly inclined at 17 degrees. And no other planet moves in that kind of way. So Pluto was an oddity. But even more important, there was its size, or lack of it. Initially, it was thought that Pluto might be larger than the Earth. Well, it's not. It is smaller than our moon, and that came as a great surprise. It's also smaller than Neptune's big satellite, Triton. Now, Pluto has a companion, Charon, discovered in 1977, and that appeared to be half Pluto's size. But even so, now look over to the right-hand side, and there you will see just a part of Neptune. And you can see how small Pluto is compared with Neptune. It's anything but a giant. Well, in 1977, the companion body, Charon, was discovered, and uh, the photograph taken by the Hubble Space Telescope is the only really good one so far, because uh, unfortunately, no space probe is yet anywhere near Pluto. And Charon appears to be about half Pluto's size. But Pluto itself is very small and very lightweight. And you can see the implications of that. It turned up in just about the position indicated by Lowell, and yet Pluto is so small, it could not possibly tug a giant planet out of position. Therefore, either Lowell's discovery was sheer luck, or else the real planet 10 awaits discovery. And anyway, what about Pluto? It doesn't seem to be an ordinary kind of planet at all. So are there any more Pluto-like objects around? Well, there's one called Chiron, don't mix up the Charon, and that's uh, shown there as a trail, and it goes around the sun in a path that keeps it most of the time between the paths of Saturn and Uranus, the last kind of place where you'd expect to find an asteroid, even though Chiron has been given an asteroid number, 2060. We don't know very much about it, but the interesting thing is that when it comes closest to the sun, as it is now, it appears to develop a kind of temporary atmosphere. On that picture, uh, Chiron is the blob over to the left, and extending from there at about um, 11 o'clock in the clock face, you can see a kind of fuzz, and that appears to be a temporary atmosphere, as though ices on Chiron's surface are being evaporated. And that may possibly lead us on to a link with comets. Now, a comet, normally, goes around the sun in a very long, narrow orbit. Halley's Comet does. Takes 76 years to go around the sun. Was last back in 1986. And a comet's icy nucleus is very small, only about 20 miles across, probably. And when the comet nears the sun, that starts to evaporate, and the comet produces a temporary atmosphere, if you like, and a head, just as Chiron appears to be doing in very modified form. So can there be some kind of a link there? And anyway, where do these things come from? Now, according to the late Jan Oort, the famous Dutch astronomer, there's a whole cloud of these things going around the sun at about a distance of one light year, six million million miles. And normally, of course, we can't see them. They're just icy bobs. But if any of them is perturbed for any reason, possibly by um, a passing star or an unknown planet, it starts to fall in toward the sun. And after a journey lasting thousands or possibly even millions of years, it comes into the inner part of the solar system and we can see it. And then one of several things may happen. Like many great comets, such as the comet of 1843, it may simply swing round the sun and return to the Earth cloud, not to come back for a great many centuries. On the other hand, it may actually fall into the sun, as comet Howard, Kuhlman, and Nichols did, but actually photographed by a satellite doing precisely that, that was destroyed. On the other hand, it may be thrown out of the solar system altogether by the gravitational pull of a planet, generally Jupiter. And that's what happened to comet Adam Roland of 1957, the famous spiked comet. It was quite conspicuous with the naked eye, and that was actually the very first picture ever shown on a sky at night program. And then there's another strange one coming up, comet Shoemaker-Levy. That is now being captured by Jupiter, 
and has actually been broken up. You can see in that picture. Quite fascinating was we believe that Comet Shoemaker Levy may crash onto Jupiter round about July the 21st next year. And what's going to happen, we don't quite know. But I can assure you we'll be saying a great deal more about that nearer the time. And then other comets, such as Enki's comet, may be captured by a planet and forced into a short period orbit, as Enki's comet has been. That comes back every three and a third years. Now, earlier on, I mentioned the very small Earth-grazing asteroids, only a few miles across generally, which may pass very close to us. Is there a link between asteroids and comets? Well, I've always been very dubious about that, but I'm much less dubious now because of the case of Comet wilson Harrington of 1949. You can see there it has a distinct tail. It turned up again many years later as asteroid 4015, and there's no trace of a tail now. So it may well be that these small Earth-grazing asteroids are simply dead comets that have lost all their dust and gas. And come to that, there are various asteroidal bodies that do have comet-like orbits. One of these is a new discovery, Pholus. And Pholus, shown there in the middle of the picture, that has an orbit that takes it right out beyond Neptune. Uh, much more like a comet than an asteroid. So we get to what is it? But Pholus appears to be rather big, again, between 1 and 200 miles across, comparable with Chiron, and therefore that appears to be very much too big to be a comet. Now, that discovery was made from Hawaii by David Jewett and Jane Lewell. And they were making a deliberate search for these things, and it was they who discovered these very remote asteroidal bodies, such as 1992 QB1. And that goes around the sun at a period of 296 years, and that does stay out right in the Neptune area. It's not the only one. They've discovered two more. One of them is 1993 FW, and there it is in the middle of the picture. Those objects right aside are, in fact, galaxies. And FW moved from one night to another, and that, of course, is how it was tracked down. Just about the same size, color, and magnitude as QB1, and presumably the same class of object. But what exactly is it? Now, it could be a planetesimal. We believe that the solar system began some between 4.5 and 5,000 million years ago, as a cloud of dust and gas surrounding the youthful sun. We call that the solar nebula. And gradually, that gas started to condense out into blobs or planetesimals. And from that, the planets actually built up. But there may well have been some planetesimals left over. And there is a very well-established theory now that way out beyond Neptune, there's a whole belt of these things. We call it the Kuiper Belt. And therefore, these new asteroidal bodies may come from there. They may, in fact, be planetesimals, and the first discovered bodies coming in from the Kuiper belt. And we've seen there may be a link with comets, even though the, the asteroidal bodies appear to be too, too large. And therefore, can there also be a link with some of the icy satellites of the other planets, and for that matter, with Pluto itself? Well, consider Neptune. Now, Neptune, the outer giant, was bypassed by Voyager 2 in 1989, sending out those lovely pictures. Look there at the great dark spot on the lovely blue background of Neptune. It's a fascinating world, but I'm more concerned now with Neptune's big satellite, which is called Triton. And that also was imaged uh, from Voyager, and it's telling me a very strange world indeed. The pole is covered with pink snow. Not ordinary snow, but nitrogen snow. And also, there is activity there. There are nitrogen geysers. This, of course, is a drawing by Pearl Dirty, but it probably is very much the scene as it would be if you could go to Triton. Apparently, below the surface, there's a layer of liquid nitrogen, and when that migrates to the surface, the pressure is relaxed, and it explodes in a shower of nitrogen vapor and, uh, and, and, and ice, if you like, and that is the cause of those geysers upon Triton, the last thing to be expected. But Triton, remember, is bigger than Pluto, although smaller than our moon, does have a thin atmosphere, and it behaves in a very curious kind of way. It goes round Neptune in a wrong way or retrograde direction. So Neptune spins one way, and Triton goes round the other way. And that case is unique in the solar system. There are various very small satellites that go round their primaries the wrong way, four in Jupiter's family, one in Saturn's, but they are certainly asteroidal and not genuine satellites. But what about Triton? Is Triton a genuine satellite of Neptune, or is it a planetesimal, rather like Pluto? Well, I think there's not much doubt now that Triton used to be an independent body and was captured by Neptune long ago. So probably it also is a planetesimal and come from the planetesimal belt. 
And that links us in surely with 1992 QB1 and the other recent discoveries. And I wonder what QB1 is actually like. Well, there's an imaginative drawing of it. It may well be like that. I don't know. We've got to wait really until a rocket probe passes by it, and that may be for some time yet. But it could be that QB1 is of that nature. And it could be a planetesimal. And therefore, what about Pluto and what about Planet 10? Well, there again, we have an imaginative view of Pluto, which does have a very thin atmosphere. Charon hanging in the Plutonian sky and the sun so far away that it appears only as an intensely brilliant uh, small disk of light. So, beyond Pluto, there may be another planet. Now, it could be a giant. If so, it's going to be so far away, it's going to be very hard indeed to find because it is going to be so faint. And the only way you can track it down, probably, is by the perturbation it exerts on the known planets or possibly upon comets. But it's, that's a long way off as yet. On the other hand, it may well be that all we're dealing with is a Kuiper belt of planetesimals. And in that case, these new discoveries may be the very first bodies coming from there. And as you can see, I think you can see, there could be quite a progression between planets, planetesimals, satellites, Earth-grazing asteroids, and even comets. They could be all linked together, and the solar system may be very much more of a connected whole than we believed. And certainly, out there in the far wastes, there are strange bodies about whose existence we knew nothing at all until very recently. And one day, Planet 10 may come to light. I very much hope that it does. Before I go, I've got one very important announcement. The European Southern Observatory is organizing an essay competition. And the subject of the essay is a night's observation with the VLT. Now, the VLT is the Very Large Telescope, not yet built, it's going to be set up in Chile, uh, and the first mirror has actually been cast. And there are 8.2 meters across, but only 177 millimeters thick. It's going to be the most powerful telescope in the world when all four mirrors are completed. Now, the essay competition is being organized by the ESO, and the brochures are available. And I've been asked to organize the English side of this, so I have, in fact, got the brochures, and uh, I can send them to you. Now, the winner will go, first of all, to Garching, outside, Ger uh, outside Munich in Germany, the uh, European headquarters of the ESO, and then they will go to La Silla in Chile to do some active work with the telescopes there. So it really is going to be a very great trip. And if you want to go in for the competition, well, I can send you the brochure. What you must do is to send a stamp to this envelope to Future Astronomers of Europe, The Sky at Night, BBC Television, London W127RJ. But there is one very important modification here. You've got to be in your last or second to last year at your public or secondary school, which means you've got about 17 or 18. And if you're not, then please don't send it send into the envelope. But if you are, then I'll send you the brochure, and uh, I wish you the very best of luck. Meanwhile, if you want the latest astronomical news, then as usual, you can dial the Sky at Night information line 0891 800 or you can dial up CFX, page 685. And um, when I come back next month, I'm going to talk to you about the latest astronomical wizard, Merlin. And so until then, good night.